I wanted to say a little bit about the text today. Um, recent uh, scholarship has led some to believe that the book of John was actually written by three different people or three different schools. And contained in that story of the woman at the well are hints to all three of those writers. The first one wrote between 60 and 65 AD. This is after the letters of Paul. And in that, the first writer was very concerned about the miracles and the signs of Jesus. And so always in that writing, Jesus performs some great miracle and someone believes and then they go and tell other people and there's this rippling effect. And so the narrative part of this story, the woman at the well, Jesus tells her everything about herself. That's the sign, that's the miracle that he knows her. And then she goes and tells all the people that Jesus um, knew her and he is the coming Messiah. That is the first writer of John who wrote that part. The second writer of John is between 65 and 70, roughly, they think, maybe five or six years later. And by that time, the community is really interested in what it means to be in the spirit of God. So all that section about living water and the spirit and... Um, you know, how you'll drink of living water and the spirit will come to you. That is the second writer. It's an editor who inserts that in. And then the third writer of John, they think is around 95, is very concerned about the missionary zeal and about Jesus and what his work is. And so all the stuff about the harvest is ready, everything is ripe, we need to go out, is written by that third editor. And so when it's all smushed together, sometimes it seems like it goes every which way. But it's important to understand that the, the scripture is not just like, you know, we learned when we were little where God says, write that down. It's not what it is. It's communities that are living in the spirit of God and gain understanding that then edit uh, these stories so that they bring life to their community. And so our job is to try and find the story that resonates with us. Will you pray with me? God of all, bring to us living water. Open our hearts to receive it. Amen. In 1960, Valerie Saving wrote the seminal, seminal article for feminist theology. It was called The Human Situation, A Feminine View. And in it, she examines the theology of the time, which pointed to the great sin as being self-assertion. It's much like the temptations that we were talking about last week, the motivators, the temptation to pursue power or money or glory in an unhealthy way so that we fall into sin, if you want to say that. It's not surprising that that self-assertion was considered the sin of the age because theologians in the 50s and 60s were in this time after World War II where the world was engaged in a kind of technological arms race. And so as they were trying to learn and understand more and control nature and each other, theologians were arguing that the human condition was essentially one of isolation and disconnectedness. And in this space where we're isolated from each other and disconnected from nature, we live in anxiety. It makes us anxious. And so this idea of self-assertion is this attempt to overcome this sense of anxiety at our own isolation by conquering. Conquering the environment and using it for our own ends, and self-assertion kind of basks in your own power, and it determines what is good according to the self, and it acquires knowledge for the sake of promoting yourself. And so to theologians in that last century, these are the great temptations of our times. These are the sins with which we live. And then they argued that the healing for this sin is love. Because love is self-giving. 
and love seeks only the good of others. And love doesn't judge, and it's not based on merit or reward, because love is unconditional forgiveness. It bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes and endures all things. It's personal. When you love someone, you treat them as a child of God. And this kind of love answers those deepest needs of humanity. It's the answer to anxiety and this self-assertion. To try and become God really is what self-assertion is. That are at the core of the sins of humanity. That's what the theologians were arguing. And Valerie Saving... She begins to feel uncomfortable with these ideas of the human condition and sin and redemption as they are being articulated. And she increasingly found that her own struggles in her life were kind of at odds of, with those that were put forward by male counterparts who were most of the theologians at the time. And she begins to wonder if as a woman, she might be differently situated. Maybe she had different struggles. Maybe she experienced life in different ways and therefore sought a different kind of redemption. And so she considers anthropologists and what they're saying about humanity and the differences in uh, gender roles. And the first thing she notes is that in every single culture, women and only women bear children. And I guess we all could have figured that out. Cross cultures, women are the ones who bear children. But what this leads to is another norm of cultures, that women in every society then form the closest relationships with infants, with children. And this means that this relationship becomes foundational for both masculine and feminine identities. Because our first relationship for most of us, almost all of us, is with our mothers. But obviously, for boys to become true men, at least according to a culture, this early identification with their mothers must be overcome in some way. Because he must become something different than his mother. And self-assertion is the means by which this is accomplished. And so for boys and men, at least back in 1960, life becomes this process of becoming something. But girls, on the other hand, according to Saving, need only to grow up to become a woman. And they see themselves in their mothers from the very beginning, and they don't need to push back against her early learning, and thus... According to Saving, a woman's life is more a process of just being instead of becoming. And just waiting for nature to take its course. And this inevitably leads to the question of whether you're going to have children. Which, of course, isn't possible for some women. And it's a path that's not taken by others. And that's true. But she says that women are shaped to think of themselves as mothers and nurturers in a relational way instead of individual ways. And then if she has children, she learns that if the child is to survive, that her own needs have to be suppressed. And sometimes you get lost in this. And so Saving says that the temptations for a woman are not pride, or will to power as they are for men. But rather the temptation is the underdevelopment or the negation of the self. Because women tend to surrender their individual concerns. And to give up their own agency in favor of that of her partner or her children. And in the process... She gets lost in these relationships without asserting her own needs. Now, obviously, a lot has changed since 1960. I mean, I just have to look to my own relationship to know that there is much more um, equal sharing of work and parenting of, by both fathers and mothers, or fathers and fathers and mothers and mothers. A lot has changed. 
She even noted that culture was becoming what she said more feminized. But today women and men are integrating this self-giving and this self-assertion. But as International Women's Day reminds us, in many cultures, these role, these gender role expectations are firmly asserted and defended. And in too many cases, women are not given opportunities for self-expression. And I think the temptation in our own culture is not to take the opportunities for self-expression. Because I know even from my own life with all the opportunities for education, I mean, I have three degrees, really. I've been to school. I'd go again if, uh, if it paid, but... <laughs> opportunities for education and self-advancement and self-promotion are open to women. But even so, I always struggle with the balance between those things that I want for myself and my role as a mother. And I don't think we are yet free of these cultural expectations, and maybe we shouldn't be. But the irony of these gender role stereotypes that seem to trap women in traditional roles is that they also trap men and all those with other gender identities. This binary way of living makes us all fit into little boxes. And they leave us all in kind of desert places where we're tempted to give in to the expectations that are dictated for us rather than seeking out personal knowledge and spiritual health that frees us from this kind of boxed, narrow-minded living. And so in today's reading, we're confronted with a woman who is truly defined by her culture. To most people, she is clearly a sinner. I mean, at least in Jesus' first century world. Some of these things have nothing to do with her personally. First, she's a Samaritan. Samaritans had mixed blood because they had intermarried with the Assyrians over the centuries. This was not allowed under Jewish law. And so this prohibition was so strong that when the Samaritans came to Jerusalem to help rebuild the temple after the exiles came back from Babylon, their assistance was refused because they were defiled in some way. And that's what led to the building of that temple on Mount Gerizim instead of going to Jerusalem. And then there's her gender. Samaritan women had been designated as perpetually unclean. She was labeled as a permanent sinner because of her race. And then so in this conservative culture where these gender roles and prohibitions are clearly defined, she is that woman who is completely defined by her relationships to someone else. And if we look deeper, deeper, we see how she has negated who she is. She's gathering water at noon instead of the common hours of dawn and dusk. Presumably because she's been ostracized by other women and doesn't want to be seen with them. She chooses to come to the well when there's no one else about. And later on we learn that she's gone from one husband to the next and that she's living with a man who's not her husband. And her identity is completely submerged into her connection with the men in her life. Such is her temptation. Such is the pressure for her in this society. There's so many reasons why Jesus and this woman should not engage in any kind of conversation. Why they should ignore each other. Why Jesus should just sit and wait for those disciples to come back with some food and water. But instead, Jesus strikes up this conversation and he asks this woman for a drink. And you can see that this is completely unexpected by her because the first words out of her mouth are to express surprise and dismay even. That he would even associate with her. And Jesus asks her then to bring her husband to him. 
And then the woman says, oh, I, I don't have a husband. And this is a quick response. And I think maybe she's trying to avoid the subject of her life. But Jesus says to her, come on now. You've had five husbands already. And the man you're with now isn't even a husband. And so there, Jesus has exposed her secret. Because she is disposable. She's desperate. She's moving from one man to another to secure her livelihood. And this is something for which she is ashamed. Because she is nothing in herself. But what she finds and sees in this declaration by Jesus is that he knows her right at her core. And he tells her who she is, how she lives, and who she loves. And this is the sign for her. That this one she is speaking with at the well is no ordinary man. This man who sees her so clearly is the anointed one. It's the one that is from God who has come to make her life and everything else clear to her. Jesus speaks to her of this promise of spiritual renewal. And he says that he is the source of living water. And he tells her that when she drinks the water from this Jacob's well, as special as it is, that she'll need another drink. But if she takes the water that he offers, she'll never be thirsty again. And in that she feels freed. Who knows if she ever understands what he's really talking about. Maybe that she asks for this living water because she's tired. She's tired of the looks and the gossip and the backbreaking work of collecting water at that well that is her duty. Somehow I think she knows that in her life she's kind of at a dead end. That she's given over herself to someone else's dreams. And that her way of coping of seeking after more and greater security has just left her life a desert. It's dry and it's barren. And she has a spiritual thirst that is unquenchable. And Jesus offers her a better way. He says there is life in the spirit. Life that is beyond life. Water that flows eternally. And it's not just for this promise of life beyond death. It's also the promise of life in our lives. The Spirit's life that renews and restores and satisfies. And that's what he offers her. Tells her that it doesn't matter where she worships or if she keeps all the laws and obeys all the rules. By speaking to her, he says, it doesn't matter what you've done, who you live with, how you've been shamed. What's important, he says, is that she comes with a truthful heart that seeks after God in a deeply spiritual way. And then maybe for the first time in her life, She's more than an isolated, shamed woman or the mistress of some man. She comes into her own. And she runs into town and she speaks from her heart about this Jesus and how he knows her. He knows her to her core. And she talks about the wonders that he has unveiled to her. And how he promises living water that will transform their lives and in her witness, others come to believe. So here's the thing. As we go through this Lenten journey, we recognize that we all have those spaces in our lives that are dry. And whether we try to cover them up by asserting ourselves and becoming like God, so that our importance is amplified, 
or we try to submerge our anxiety into our relationships with others so that we live vicariously and avoid all that hard work of finding out who we truly are. We know there's a better way. And what Jesus offers us is this opportunity to come into ourselves as we truly are. Jesus promises that if we seek after God and God's purposes, and we worship God with our hearts that are vulnerable and open and seeking truth, that living water will pour into our lives and we will truly live. So this is the choice that is set before us. Wherever we find ourselves, do we just continue in our desert lives, drinking from water that can never truly satisfy our thirsty souls? Or do we turn towards our eternal home and drink of the living water that sustains our lives in this world and the next? That's our question for this Lenten journey. Amen.